This panel is called Owning the Web Together, Peer Production and Sharing, in case you're not in the right panel. My name is Seda Gursis. I'm a computer scientist at the University of Leuven, uh, and I'm very happy to welcome Ella, Sherman, and Tim to this panel. Um, I will not go through the total description of the panel, which is basically uh, a general bigger set of questions about peer production and sharing. What we will do today is to think about cooperative platforms specifically, uh, how we will potentially transition to them, what is it that they are, what are their kind of beliefs or um, aspirations, both with respect to economic change, labor conditions, but also information flows, which is the intersection, I think, between the topic and the privacy camp. Um, I will quickly introduce the panelists all together, and then we'll kick it off with Tim starting off. Um, so I'll start with Ella, Ella Kago, sitting in, in the middle, as a digital strategist uh, working at the intersection of art, culture, and technology. Since the mid-90s, she's produced and designed media art exhibitions, network performance, mobile and location-based applications, as well as temporary spaces for cultural exchange. Most important to note for the, panel, for, for the panel here today is that she has founded Supermarked in 2012, has um, written uh, and co-authored a research study on the potentialities of the sharing and collaborative economy in Berlin, and is the co-initiator of the platform co-op initiative, if you know about that, with Trevor Schultz and Nathan Schneider in New York, uh, saying that they're one of the satellites in, in Berlin, um, further in the cause of platform co-op. And she's also one of the founding members of Cozy Work, a digital freelancer cooperative in Germany. Sherman Boschmir, Mosch, Moschmir, yep. um, is the founder of the Blockchain Hub and runs Blockchain Hub in Berlin, which by now has expanded internationally and functions decentrally. She's very proud of that. Um, she's on the advisory board of the Estonian e-residency program, a curator of the DAO, and regularly speaks at conferences and consults on blockchains and smart contracts. She also did a PhD in IT management at the Vienna University. Tim Jordan comes to us from the Sussex Humanities Lab. Um, he has been involved in analysis of the social and cultural meaning of the internet and cyber space since the mid 90s. Uh, we're very happy to have someone. I thought you had a joke. Um, oh, come on, you just broke into it. <laughs> I don't know, cyber itself is a joke. Right. Um, he has written a number of books, uh, the most recent of, of which is um, titled Information Politics liberation and exploitation in a digital society, which is which is about the politics of information, which, Tim, we would like you to start the panel with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and our panel to sit on. Um, I'm going to start fairly generally because I wanted to start with the question of why um, things like platform cooperatism are really important. Um, and I hope I'm not restating the obvious for everyone. Um, and I wanted to start because it seems to me important um, to consider that we live in an age in which, in which the amount of information, the speed of information, and the ability of information to recombine or to recurse through recursions has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. Um, and information has a particular quality, which is often commented on, but I think needs to be foregrounded, which is that it's available for simultaneous complete use. That is. If something's converted into, if something's converted into the right information format, then we can all have equal access at the same time, totally to that piece of information, whether it's a book or a film or a set of ideas presented in a different format, or a set of data. What happens to information is that it has to be turned into something. Um, it has to be privatised to make it not available to us. And uh, economists have generally called this term information non-rival for this reason. And I argue that it's important for us to, to turn that around to, to see that information inherently is something that should be collectively available to all of us um, because it has this enormous, this tremendous capacity um, to be available for all of us. Information is also at its most powerful when it can be subject to recombination and particular to recursion. Recursion in the sense, um, we can go into what recursion means in detail, but in the sense that you can feed the output of a process back as an input. So that you can take information, and this is what all the big platforms do, they take information about ourselves and they feed that information back in repeatedly um, in order to create kind of data maps um, 
in order to create a sense of who to send advertising to, in order to create a sense of how to answer a search query. This produces exponential increases in the amount of information. That sets some of the issues for platforms in that it's often through platforms that this kind of recombination is made, and it's often through platforms, privatised platforms in the main, that information is converted into something that um, is not available to all of us. Um, and that happens in a funny way, almost in the background. Platforms like Facebook or Snapchat or any of those don't care that much about my information. They, you know, it's useful for them to know my age, my gender, my holiday preferences, where I work, what kinds of books I buy. That's useful. What's powerful is when they can know that and put it in and correlate it with all of your information on the same things. And so that extra, that bit that a platform generates by recombining, correlating, using recursions, falls to the platform controller almost naturally. The platform has to create it, but then it just falls there. And it's invisible to us. We can't necessarily see it. We can impute it. You can impute that these ads are served to me because of certain things I've done. If I go and, go and examine coming to Brussels, the fact that I then get a series of ads for hotels in Brussels for the next month you know, is something I can see. But actually, the real processes going on behind are things that are hidden to me that are privatised, which do not need to be. This implies two kinds of labour. There's the labour of those of us who are inputting, whether it's to a cooperative or a privatised platform, we're all using them. And it's not just inputting our personal data, it's our use of them, the way we use them, where we go, what we do on them, that can be collected, that the platform collects. There's a second form of labour, which is the labour to do that recombination and to choose what kinds of recombinations and recursions to implement on a platform. So not only is, and just to conclude this kind of rather, I know I'm doing this rather broadly and I'm happy to come back and I'm sure we'll come back to concrete arguments, this thing, but to conclude it that not only is information by its nature something that could be collective or communal or available to all of us, it's also something that's most powerful when it has that nature. It's at its most powerful in terms of when it can be when a group or a community or a collective of some sort is using some means by which to correlate, recombine, use recursions to develop that information in the directions that it wants to take that information. So platform cooperativism as an idea, as opposed to specific platforms and specific forms of cooperation, um, which I think we'll get into later, um, is an important idea because it's an idea that captures how information should be serving communities, people in general, as opposed to their current situation in which the vast reservoirs of data are locked up in either um, state agencies um, or in private companies. Um, uh, for those who've ever spent the time to have a quick look at the, the pictures Google allows of its server farms or to follow the history of how Google built its server farms, or to do similar for whether it's the NSA in the USA, GCHQ in UK, Facebook, or any of the large platforms, um, we'll know that there is a huge amount of information there which potentially is available to all of us, but which in fact is locked up. And it's, to me, it's platform cooperativism which challenges that idea, which is the fundamental um, impulse towards what we're talking about today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, before we go on, just a show of hands. Who has heard of platform cooperativism? Co cooperativism? Okay. All right, so maybe we need to do a short intro introduction to that. And who has heard of the blockchain and how it works? Has a good sense of it? A greater number. Okay, I think that gives you guys a bit of a sense of how to introduce your interventions. So the floor is yours, Ella. Thank you. Well, um, thanks for, for inviting me to be part of this, of this panel. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily an expert on platform co-ops, but um, I have a big interest in um, alternative economies, and I've been working on that field since quite a while. And when we talk about platform co-ops today, I've, sometimes I think it's quite a misleading term, and I prefer this idea of the internet of ownership 
over platform co-ops because again we are talking about platforms which uh, Kim also pointed out uh, is in itself a problematic term uh, because it evokes this idea of, uh, of centralistic power and control and Sherman will also draw on that that there are a number of problems with it but from a workers perspective of course um, it's it's interesting and I, I think it could be great to take a look back in history of co-ops because uh, when we talk about co-ops today um, we have to realize it's not a new thing it's actually it really draws back to more than 150 years ago and um, maybe the co-ops started off at a time when people realized that the industrialization and this this market economy was just um, was just emerging back then and I guess it dawned on many people that it would be clever to unite and to create a, a structure which they could control rather than being controlled of, um, of the market economy, which, which was just on the rise. And I guess it's, um, it's, it's, qu it's quite logic that at this point in time where we are today, um, where we realize um, problems uh, with capitalist um, structures all over the world, and where we, where we can witness the results of the globalization, that again, people start to get together and think of ways <coughs> how to create value together and how to, um, how to establish new forms of ownership and democratic control in their work. So I guess that's, it's very interesting to see, to see the historical dimension in it as well. The whole idea, if we talk about platform co-ops, is to, um, to take the old, model of the co-op which is um, traditionally owned by the workers and which can take on many different forms of, um, of governance, of uh, decision taking, of um, also budgeting, taking that model and bringing it in the digital realm. So uh, when we talk about, about platforms um, then we very often talk about an alternative to those monopolistic platforms like Airbnb and Uber, so just to name the, the two prominent, most prominent ones. And this is again the big discussion that is going on in the platform code movement, whether we should actually fight fire with fire, whether that is so clever or not, uh, trying to create uh, an alternative to Uber by building yet another platform. Um, but that's just where we are at. And Sherman talks about uh, that being the web 2.0. And there is certainly something waiting for us that is more decentralized and that, is, that, has, that has new options of, um, uh, uh, of, of governance and, um, and control than we are at today. I think this is all about, for us the big question is on how can we design this transition in which we are at right now. So uh, the most important thing or the most important questions I have at this point, um, about, it's about the design of these platform copes. For me, accessibility plays a key role. If we really want to create a software that allows, for instance, um, an alternative Uber to control their business activities, to uh, take care of online transactions, then everyone must be able to understand the software and to contribute to it. And to, uh, and to become part of this global understanding of that code and how to change it. So the question is how to, how to, make, how to make the technology more accessible and how to increase everyone's literacy about technology. Because uh, we might have the best intentions in creating a human alternative to the market economy, but if we don't have the understanding of the technology and the possibilities we have, then um, it's... We, we will eventually very quickly run against the wall and not, not being able to proceed any further. So for me, accessibility, literacy, and uh, platform co-op design is a key question. And then ultimately, what I would like to discuss is that the only reference model we have, if we talk about um, economic um, impact, is the traditional business plan. And I'm very interested since many years to create an alternative matrix that also um, informs about eco-social impact of those co-ops. So what do they actually bring about in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of social uh, advance? And I hope that we can 
we can draw on that and maybe Sherman you can just take it from there and lead us to the web 3.0. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well uh, just to answer your question how how do we make technology more accessible? Well, we first need to start teaching coding in kindergarten. If we don't do that, it really uh, blockchain won't be a solution either because then these open source blockchains will also be walled gardens because nobody understands the code and only few people can contribute. But um, yeah, blockchain. So I saw that quite most people here uh, raised their hands. Uh, so blockchain seems to be a buzzword right now, but who is really comfortable explaining what blockchain is but, or what you can do with blockchain, rather, where the game changer is? Could you raise your hands again? Okay, so I would like to give you, therefore, a brief introduction because I do this regularly. So last year when I asked the question, who knows what blockchain is, almost nobody raised their hand. This year, almost everybody raises their hand, yet when I ask them, can you explain it, they can't. So I'll give you a very brief introduction introduction. So um, if you think of the internet, uh, there are a few ways to, to explain it. I'll try to. Um, basically, drawing on what you said before, it's about the question who owns the data. And blockchain disrupts the idea of who owns the data. Because as opposed to the world we live today, where data is uh, stored on <laughs> servers, and the internet connects these servers to each other uh, uh, in a client-server way, where computers communicate through the internet, but data is always stored locally. Uh, blockchain builds on the idea of peer-to-peer -peer technologies that are not new per se, but it um, builds on that uh, idea uh, from the um, that has been around since the 90s, but combining it with a set of no other technologies uh, or, or concepts like uh, cryptography and, um, and incentive mechanisms, um, it creates this very powerful technology where for the first time we can incentivize in the code the behavior of the people who are part of the group. This is a huge game changer. It took me a year to understand from the first time I heard what Bitcoin and blockchain is to the point where I understood how powerful this is, it took me a year. So if this is more or less the first time, it um, um, you might uh, need some time to grasp the whole thing. Um, basically, we're moving from a world where data is stored on servers to a world where data is decentralized. <coughs> Blockchain is only one of many technologies uh, that bring us to enter the era of the decentralized web. So if we think of the internet in the early 90s, the, the early World Wide Web, it revolutionized information. Um, the Web 2, 10 years later, brought us those platforms. It revolutionized uh, relations. It brought us the platforms, on one hand, uh, the social media platforms, and on the other hand, the e-commerce platforms. Um, and, uh, but the problem, so it brought, the Web 2 brought people closer to each other. It created this peer-to-peer -peer economy, but always with a middleman. The middleman being Facebook, being Amazon, being uh, Airbnb, being Uber, uh, even being Wikipedia because uh, the data is stored centrally in a way. Um, now the Web3 and blockchain is only one of the technologies of the Web3 uh, allows us, will uh, re get rid of this middleman. And it will bring producers and consumers together without the need for a middleman because data is not stored centrally anymore and verification of data and the clearing of data is not done centrally anymore. Because today we still need, for example, Airbnb as a platform or any other competitor to Airbnb. Because if I don't know you, I don't know you, I don't even know your name, but I want to rent your apartment, I need to go through a trusted third party who will guarantee that you really receive the payment to me and, uh, and um, guarantee to you that if I damage your apartment or if I don't show up, you still get your money, right? We need this middleman that we are like so dooming right now. We need them. The problem is that these platforms have created a concentration of power and they own the data 
and they dictate the terms of governance of how in this peer-to-peer -peer network people interact with each other. Blockchain is this game changer that allows us to completely disintermediate uh, because we can now build smart contracts on top of this peer-to-peer -peer network called the blockchain that will auto, it's like I, and the smart contract is a piece of code that runs on this peer-to-peer -peer network where the rules of behavior are programmed into the code. Um, we agree on how we want to execute a transaction. And if both parties or all parties uh, comply with the predefined conditions, the contract is automatically enforced. Therefore, we don't need a middleman anymore. And um, so the real actually uh, game changer of blockchain is not the underlying peer-to-peer -peer network and the protocol, but it's the, the, the smart contract running on top of it. And the highest form of a smart contract is a decentralized autonomous organization. It's an organization um, uh, that is um, where the bylaws of how people interact in this organization, for profit or non-profit, um, are put in the code. And it acts as a smart contract. Everything is predefined and you can opt in and opt out. And you can be part of the decision-making process. Um, who knows what Bitcoin is and how it really works? So Bitcoin can be seen as the first autonomous, decentralized autonomous organization. Nobody runs Bitcoin. There is nobody who owns Bitcoin. Bitcoin as the network in the end. May, may I stop you and tell you to stop? because Bitcoin had hard forks. There's always another layer of governance. Yes, yes, I, I do fully is, agree this with is the that. Cool aid. I did not expect the privacy camps. I'm serious. I really I find it a bit borderline offensive, actually. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, if you would have let me. Uh, then, so then basically, Bitcoin can be seen as the first autonomous organization. It doesn't mean that I fully agree, and I wrote a paper on that, that we need governance beyond the consensus layer. Fully agree on that. But let me explain, because many of these people, you're, you came later, many of these people don't know what blockchain is. So I'm kind of trying to begin in the beginning. Um, and um, so I agree with what you say. This is one of my research areas, governance beyond the consensus layer, um, because we need that. And it's, we see with blockchain, with Bitcoin, we see it with what happened with the DAO and the, the Ethereum hard fork, that if you don't know, have governance structures beyond the consensus layer, we have a problem. So, but this technology is in the very, very early stages. And the reason why um, Eli and I were collaborating is because we have these two, two communities. We have the platform co-ops, which saw a pain point of the web two of who owns this data and regaining control and ownership of this data and the decision-making processes that built on this data. And bringing together also the, the collective experience of, of the governance ideas that were or are being developed in the platform co-op movement based on the technology of the Web2 and merging it with what is now emerging as a new technology in the Web3, as some call it, and because many people in blockchain have this um, romantic idea that you can code, you can put everything in the code, that you can have governance by code only. And I challenge this idea and we need to develop this further. And uh, we're trying to move and merge those two communities this which is more math and tech driven, <laughs> and this community that's more social <coughs> consensus driven, because we need both consensus layers. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that short, uh, very timely introductions. Um, I want to kind of look at the intersection of the, the platform co-ops and blockchain with respect to privacy. You, you all talked about control over information flows, but I feel like you were talking about different kinds of control. One was on the aggregation and, and the ability to use the data to optimize systems and opening up that control. Uh, whereas in the blockchain, I see this more individual control of where your data goes. So you have a greater agency, at least one of the promises of the blockchain. 
as to where you know you were talking er earlier in our discussion about having your data in your wallet and deciding where it goes, uh, but also the possibility of making data publicly accessible so that everybody can compute. Um, from a privacy perspective, um, one would argue that there are power relationships, there are issues with the fact that your data is publicly available, there are power relationships also in who can do aggregation. Um, we have known the history of, for example, FOIAs in the US where very powerful companies have taken this open data, made something useful out of it, and then closed that so that openness can be very limited very quickly. There are also issues of not just protection of individual <coughs> privacy, but protection of minorities. How do you make sure that not only does the DOA speak DAOs, to, yeah. Um, yeah. sorry, that, DAOs um, yeah, speak, to, yeah. um, speak to the majority, but they also speak to, or, or, or somebody has the ability yeah. to understand the impact, uh, potential impact and potential discriminatory impact towards minorities and what could be done in a majority consensus system. Um, so these are all worries um, that come from the privacy circles, and I wonder, with some of the propositions you made, um, if there are some tensions and how you see these tensions being resolved in the future. Well, maybe just coming back to this, uh, what, what I said before, to, to this uh, alternative metrics to the business logic or to, to the business plan. I believe that many platform co-ops, when people get together and they want to organize business collectively, it's, not, it's just not about business data only, but just for instance, if we think of an alternative, a co-op alternative model to Uber, like um, in Germany there's uh, the open taxi movement rising. So if, if there is a, a, a platform, a software <coughs> in the center that controls these transactions, <coughs> Uh, then the software does not only inform about the business transactions taking place, but it also um, stores information about the, uh, the working hours. It might, it might store information on maternity leaves, on many, many things that even get close to people's health and private lives. So uh, when, we, when we talk about the, the co-op model as an alternative to the market economy, we can't really exclude all these human and private factors from the economic transactions. And I think this is really something we don't have answers right away. Mm -hmm. how, how, can we, how can we really separate the private, the health mm -hmm. issues, the social yeah. dimension from, from the business case? Mm -hmm. And I guess this really requires a whole new thinking and a whole new understanding of um, business metrics and social economic implications on how we want to e include them in, in our technological progression. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of questions about that, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I have some technical answers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so on the blockchain, or, or in the decentral web, as I said, blockchain is only one of the technologies, so... Um, we have to move towards self-sovereign identity. Who knows what self-sovereign identity is? Okay, so it's owning your data. Um, the idea now we live in this uh, client server based world, as I said before, where data is stored on servers and they're walled gardens and who the person or the entity that owns your data on that server um, um, has to manage and protect that data. And um, so when you um, register at the bank today or uh, you have to register all your names and your address, you, you, have, you, you create a new account with a new bank and you have to enter all your private details, who's my husband, who's my cat, who's my house, and I'm exaggerating. And you do that at bank A, usually maybe you have a second <laughs> bank, you do that at every platform where you register name, address and everything, and sometimes even your credit card details. And this has privacy aspects, is that practicability uh, aspects, because when your credit card, for example, changes, you have to go back and on each platform, you have to change that data. In a world of self-sovereign identity, the identity is with you. Uh, with public private key technology, you own the data in your wallet, physical wa wallet on your, or a virtual wallet. Um, and you authenticate that you are you <laughs> without sending the data, without the data being stored on the server of that bank. And there are a few really interesting startups, Yolocom being one, uh, using social link data combined with blockchain technology to create identity-based solutions where you really own your data. The good thing is that based on, uh, you, there's the GDPR um, law, 
being passed on on who who knows about the GDPR? Well, okay, half of the room. So um, at least in, in in Europe, companies are forced to move towards these new solutions, and I think I'm quite positive that we will uh, have new solutions uh, based on the concept of self-sovereign identity. You control your data, you control who has access to your data. On the blockchain now, um, as you, you, you said, we have the problem of public blockchains at least. Um, on the Blocks Explorer, uh, transaction data is transparent. And um, so if I know your public key, I know what you're doing. If I can connect your public key, your public address, with your private identity, there is full transparency. Now, as opposed to a client-server-based world, um, everybody has access to that transparency. And as I said, the, these technologies in the very early stages were moving from that being transparent to so-called zero-knowledge proofs. I don't want to get into the technical details, but nowadays we have new cryptocurrencies like Monero and Zcash, for example, um, that try to um, tackle this issue of the transparency on the block explorer or of being able to track with big data of uh, who are you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Tim, but that contrasts a lot yeah. with what you said about yeah. collective data and the labor aspects. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I would say um, <coughs> we need to think quite hard about privacy in these contexts and we need to think quite hard about what we mean by information in a privacy context in which we are seen as owning the information about ourselves. Because <clears throat> that implies a particular, particular relationship of ownership to information. It also implies, I think, and one of the reasons why we need to think hard about it, is that who creates the information owns it. And that means all the aggregation. So even if we all own if everyone is a sovereign individual owning their information, the power of the information, as I said before, is much greater when it's aggregated or when it's aggregatable, when people can take it and use it in different ways. But the aggregation, which can be anonymised in lots of these places potentially, potentially they're not that keen on necessarily connecting you as an individual. They're keen on knowing that a certain type of individual has certain types of likes and dislikes which they can aggregate with others. Um, and therefore deliver back information to people. So that information is rightly the own, owned by whoever does the aggregation. So even in a world of you know, sovereign individuals, there has to be some way of putting those sovereign individuals' information back in correlation to each other, or we end up back pre-Google. Well, um, I would like to challenge you on that idea, uh, because we, the thing is that the world Luckily, it, it's, it's been taking a long time because the idea of peer-to-peer -peer networks has been around for a long time and the idea of open source and, and, and having open platforms and building on top of each other um, has been around for a long time. And um, I think it's moving into that direction. Example, so Bitcoin uh, and uh, Ethereum and other public blockchains, the nature actually of blockchains uh, per se was to be open source and public. Um, now, when fintech, uh, financial industry, started jumping on the blockchain trail, they said, like, ooh, that's an interesting technology, we'll amputate it, do, like, call it distributed ledger technology and make it, like, kind of um, um, uh, permissioned, where, uh, you, where the nodes in the network are members of the network, right? Um, so, for example, there is this bank in consortium, uh, R3, that started um, to, to work on a project like that, and... Um, they wanted to do this private solution that was protected um, and they recently made it open source because they understood that their services, nobody will start building services on top of their network if they're not open. So I think we're seeing gradually a paradigm change uh, even with, with very big, big companies that are used to protect their data and be closed source to a deeper understanding even uh, among the establishment that open source and open networks is the way to go and that we have to rethink business models. And storing data and hosting data, we, it, there is a historic reason why uh, this also happened. One was because there was first the computer and then the internet. We started connecting the, the computers with the internet. 
So we had system architectures that were based around like standalone computers. And we're now for the first time rethinking these architecture. And with the internet, in the early days of the internet, information was free. And when then uh, commerce started uh, building business around it, there was the psychological barriers uh, around uh, having like kind of uh, paywalls. So people were used not to pay for information and services on the internet very often. And we are seeing that this is changing also because um, the transaction costs of payments, thanks to Bitcoin and blockchain technology, are reducing. So I think many of the problems that you're, you're addressing, rightfully, will be solved in the future based on these new technologies. Tim, do you want to take that oh, on? I'd, I'd, yeah. I'm sure there's plenty. I'd, I would just very quickly say that seems to be getting very close to saying the technology will solve our social and and economic and cultural problems. Very close to saying that the, the, the inherent nature of blockchain technology means peer-to-peer -peer and these things have to happen. And I'm afraid I don't quite see it. I see the potential for it to be to happen, but why I kind of wanted to start with what I think of as the politics of cooperative is platform, whether that's articulated through blockchains or through different kinds of platforms or whatever, is that it's a political kind of struggle. Um, about the kinds of ways that information is used, our conceptions of information and who gets to access them, who gets to aggregate them, who gets to see the aggregations, If you, even if you didn't do the aggregation or weren't part of it. Those all <coughs> seem to me to be a, a set of questions that we need to think about. And I'll just finish on the, the one question. The reason information appeared to be free in the early internet was because you weren't allowed to have commercial applications in the US on the internet because it was NSF, National Science Foundation, funded. And it wasn't until they split that and allowed commercial applications. So it was a regulatory framework, yeah. a, a nation state's regulatory framework that creates that context. And I suppose I'm pointing back from the, the abilities of a certain kind of technology to see that that technology um, will be in various contexts and it will be a kind of political struggle for us to form it in certain ways. I agree with that. I agree. Like blockchain as was the early internet. Um, let me just get yeah. a little bit of Ella's input into, your, into this discussion. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, as we as we see um, uh, political and economical systems crumbling these days, it becomes very clear that we have we are really facing a very complex field, and I think this puts huge challenges on us on redefining how we want to design politics in the future, how we want to design economic transactions among among uh, people on a local but also on an international level. I think uh, th this is a moment where, where we really have to redefine our whole thinking. And I kind of like that because uh, I grew up with this idea, okay, everything has been said before, everything has been done before, there is <coughs> not much new. And then there was this, the, the emergence of the internet and everyone was really excited about it and by, by the technological possibilities. But right now I feel this is a moment of change and uh, we, are, we are sitting here, we are discussing like, okay, the, the technological um, possibilities, but on the other hand, all those still unsolved and totally open questions concerning social uh, structures, concerning um, our, our idea of, uh, of, of, a, of a market economy, and also our, our idea of a democracy and how it might work. <coughs> I have the feeling we have much more questions than answers uh, these days. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just very curious to see uh, uh, answers from the field of philosophy or you know, from, from the arts, because uh, very often these, these domains are excluded from, from, this, from this debate. But maybe, uh, maybe it would be really interesting to open that field of discussion and invite uh, other thinkers and people representing other other fields of, of practice because this is not just to be tackled by economists or technocrats this is this is much mm -hmm. bigger mm -hmm. I know this is a very vague answer but right. just, I just want to open this scope a little bit more okay maybe we'll go to the audience a little bit and then we'll come back to some of the questions we discussed earlier any questions from the audience um, can I ask um, if you're comfortable with that they turn the microphone around but just to come to the microphone do you mm -hmm. mind just so that it's on video. It's, otherwise, I repeat your question yeah. and it's not going to be as elegant. I brought my back to you and, and talking to the, to the camera. No, no, here. You, there's a microphone right here. Sorry for that. Uh, that that's okay. Yes? Yeah. All right. I think. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, my support to Tim's um, 
opinion on, uh, on technology and society, I'm absolutely sure that technology will not solve the social and economic problems. It will solve certain problems and immediately create other problems. So it's rather restructure the problem space. But on the other hand, we would like to restructure this problem space and then it's support to you that that's a good chance to do so. <coughs> but <coughs> let's don't expect the, uh, the solving of all, all the problems. Now two questions. One, <coughs> one is about the, the apps like, uh, like Uber or, or Airbnb and things like that. These um, platforms generate extreme views, polarized views in society. Some people say that these, <coughs> these applications are <coughs> modern, trendy, cheap, good for the young, democratic, and the other side uh, who tries to tax it or, or to try to ban it. These are evil, these are conservative, Stone Age-minded people, and things like that. And only a very few have a, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Uh, very few have um, ideas about uh, more, more elaborated ideas about the self-exploitation possibilities and the, and the, the lack of, um, of um, uh, insurance and things like that. How can, you <coughs> uh, how can you convince the people, those who, who are at either side of this, uh, of this use, to change? the whole system and introduce something which is better, maybe blockchain or some others. They have their own uh, ideas carved in stone. This is absolutely good. This well, is evil. Why should we uh, introduce something else? Well, it's not central planning. My, my yeah, yeah. answer is, so um, Uber will not change because they have a business model built on the concept of the data in the walled <coughs> gardens. If they're if they're intelligent, they're like in the secret now building peer-to-peer -peer solutions on the blockchain, uh, because eventually, eventually, they will be gone. Because we already see startups like Arcade City building blockchain-based Uber, right? So um, nobody will come and centrally decide that uh, in a free market economy. People, you have the early adopters of technology who understand this technology and they will start building services. And once, right now we're in the very, very, very early stages of blockchain, very early stages. And we need for things like that to really go into the mass, we need some network effects. So, um, but once those network effects are here, and blockchain is still not very user friendly, blockchain technologies are not very user friendly. Once they are, and once there are certain network effects, um, Uber will either need to adopt or they will be gone because there will be competitors that I can, I can name them that I think we can talk in private later um, that are already building such solutions. So Sherman, I'm going to intervene here a little bit because I don't think that Uber is just a labor organization company. I think Uber is a company with big ambitions with respect to automated cars and as a result a company that's interested in cities and taking them over yeah. in many different ways. So do you think, and this is a question to all of you, that it's reasonable just to think about platform cooperatives as replacing the labor aspect when it's actually about collecting data that is much, with, with much greater ambitions? Um, and it's really to, to all three. Um, but also, um, you, you talked about like the, the kind of advantages of the free markets, but one of the critiques of these companies is that they're using that free market idea to under, undermine labor regulation so how do you deal with this tension that these different um, platforms can arise because we have this neoliberal economy where it's exactly the problem that we're trying to address by creating better labor conditions? So those two questions. Please. The first thing I think we need to... Yeah, one more question. Yes, but... Please okay. so I'll, I'll try to put okay. you quickly. There's no such thing as a free market. Uh, all markets are regulated one way or another. So the question is, how is some, what is a free market, what kind of regulations, you know, who is able to operate in that kind, in what is called free markets. Um, so we need to examine those, and so it comes back to the kind of the, the politics of it, not just the kind of technologies of those things. And I think you point to one thing which is, which I think we need to be careful of, which is that one of the effects of the technologies and the platforms we've got, and I think potentially a more radical effect of blockchain technologies for you is disintermediation. 
is the removing of the, the middle. Um, but the middle includes a number of other things. It includes labour, it includes unions, it includes um, you know, the city. fire regulations, the it includes a number of things that I'm not altogether comfortable are just by fiat done away with, by technology done away with. Mm. So I, I, again, I think it's a matter of really exploring the nature of the technologies and what they're, they're creating mm -hmm. um, in a context in which there are you know, huge networked effects already on, an, on mm. privatised platforms. It's very hard. I ask my students um, when we're doing searches a week to not use Google for a week and to keep a diary of, of how they go when I give them a range of other search engines and very few of them last the week um, using it because it's such a powerful kind of networked effect because of the way it's developed. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, if we talk about Airbnb and Uber, these are the ultimate forms of the, of the gig economy where every, everyone puts themselves on the market and sells their, their work at a ridiculous price and where they are, they are receiving a, uh, a compensation for their work, but that, that is not, uh, it's not equivalent to any market price and it doesn't really, it doesn't really touch upon um, workers' rights, health insurance or anything. And I, and I think that's exactly what, what these monopolists are uh, benefiting from. But you know, apart from the from the workers' rights, it's also uh, that those practices they also drain entire uh, cities uh, in terms of, you know, the, it, all those transactions are just being made for the benefit of the of the of the company. There are no taxes, for instance, uh, you know, and all the money that would normally go into health insurance or other forms of you know of of, of organizing workers' lives and rights. It's it's just go it just goes in the pocket of, of the company, so uh, I I think what is interesting to see today when we talk about platform co-op models as alternatives, um, there are more and more cities in Europe that are currently exploring, for instance, a model of a fa fair B in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. There is a group of people that is trying to implement a fair B and B initiative, uh, where um, the you know. Where well, basically the, this this monopolistic middleman is being cut out, but still there are central structures and th there there is some kind of centralistic control and there is the local government involved as a player that receives a certain percentage, that receives also some taxes for it. So, th what what these models try to create is an ecosystem, and I think that is that is much more interesting than just looking at the at the one-on-one -on -one transaction between a monopolist player and those, uh, those totally unsecured workers that are, that are engaging in this process. For me, the big question is, how can we ensure to create uh, platform co-op ecosystems where local economies benefit from and where we create more value with every transaction? And I think that is, that is the big question that is very often left out. This is not just about making profit. This is not not just about, um, uh, um, yeah, expanding on the on the possibilities of economic transactions by economy. But this is really about creating value and about redefining our understanding of how we want to live together, social values, and so on. Shall we come back to your second question? My impression is that <coughs> both of you would like people understand how the new system would work. But I'm afraid most people would uh, look for applications which are convenient, cheap, and they would use that, and they, they're not, interesting, uh, in, not interested in, uh, in a kind of uh, identity questions and things like that. The best thing is uh, to start teaching uh, kids in the kindergarten what, what is it, but it takes too long. It's, it will take <laughs> 10 or 15 years until they grow up, and when they grow up, then the technology will be completely different from now. So how, how could you reduce this gap? How could you make well, people more uh, aware of this? We're already on a quite <coughs> good track. Uh, uh, if we start <coughs> teaching coding in kindergarten <coughs> today, and we really need to start now. And um, that is one thing we need to do. I'm, um, maybe to, 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 um, to clear up a misunderstanding, obviously I'm a bit, big advocate of blockchain and decentralized technologies. I fully agree that blockchain is only a technology and it's only a tool. And um, 
and um, just as the internet, it's, it, it has the potential to spark a social economic revolution and we need to discuss all the issues that are relevant here. And one thing that I'm seeing is like early blockchain advocates had the, like the, the idea of complete intermediation, the complete decentralization. And what I'm seeing with the blockchain hub, and this is why it was important for me to, to mention it, I created the blockchain hub in Berlin. And a few months into my activities, I was approached by other people around the world saying, hey, we would like to do something like that um, in Brussels, in Vienna, etc. So uh, I, and they asked me for permission or how to do it. And I'm like, yeah, sure, do it. And they're like, how? And I was like thinking for a long time and I'm like, well, I cannot start running a centralized organization. So we started setting up this decentralized organization, but without the DAO, just like by creating, you know, a tool set and, um, you know, a little bit leaned on the idea of um, holacracy. I don't know uh, if you know the concept. So I defined a constitution and mission statement, a tool set, a logo and everything. So everybody can take this but the local hubs are economically independent. We collaborate where it makes sense. Um, otherwise, everybody is independent. And what we saw very early on is that even though all of us, obviously, because we're running blockchain hubs, right, we have this, this um, passion for complete decentralization, we still, in our head, work centrally because we've been, um, we've been, we grew up in families that were top-down structured, went to schools that were top-down structured, and started working in jobs that were top-down structured. So while we have this, this um, longing for a more decentralized world, we still lack the tools of how to behave in a decentralized world. So as much as we need to understand the code, and to the develop the code and uh, make it more private and all that stuff, we also need to ha learn how to interact more decentrally and more self-sovereign and less dependent on command and control thinking because this is the real biggest challenge that we see and we're seeing it in the Bitcoin community, we're seeing mm -hmm. it in the Ethereum community, that there is still a lot of command and control thinking uh, at the same time, and this is juxtaposes the, the, the whole idea of uh, what blockchain is trying to do. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, Walter. Yeah. <coughs> um, my question is more about cooperative organization or two, two corporations is, um, but in a way it also applies to peer-to-peer -to -peer technology, and that is the negative effects of network effects is that you it becomes at a certain scale much harder to um, change your nodes to roll let's say when we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer software like um, a cryptocurrency it becomes some point becomes really hard to update all the nodes to a new, a new version of the code and when, you, when we're talking about organizations it becomes much harder to um, upgrade your workforce basically because you're not no longer treating like in hierarchical organization, your workers as disposable items that you can replace with fresher, newer, spiffy, uh, upgraded ones compared to in a, in a cooperative. So in, in an, a cooperative organization seems to be fundamentally unable to be as agile in terms in the face of technology, technological change. And I would like to hear your thoughts on how to tackle that issue. Mm. Could you say a little bit more, just in case there are people in the audience that don't know what you mean by agile? As in literally agile, as in the ability to change course, mm -hmm. as in take a, the, the traditional cooperatives uh, we know from the late 90s, early, 19th century, early 20th, which are mostly agrarian oriented uh, cooperatives, are still around basically because their core business has not changed that fundamentally. Cooperatives outside that sphere are pretty rare, I think primarily because technological change is harder to implement or uh, lots of technological and social economic change are hard to, to address in that kind of organization. And it also applies to true peer-to-peer -peer technology. One of the reasons Signal is still not federated is because Moxie uh, Marlin Spike, the main architect of that peer-to-peer -peer messaging tool, or not really peer-to-peer really -peer messaging tool, doesn't want to go full peer-to-peer -peer because it does not allow for quick changes in the security architecture of that tool as soon as you become federated enough. And that is his, his basic argument against going so in the face of a lot of opposition for people who feel like well, you're creating a new centralized architecture. 
it's fundamentally this this is talking about one hand about a technical tool but also about organization but it's fundamentally the same problem in, mm. at least but i think it is. Are you are talking mm. about uh, about co-op design right about how, how designing these these organizations did i no more that? about flexibility of networks yeah. right yeah. because you know for, for me um uh, the, the thing is, I have witnessed that over the past couple of years, at least in Germany, it's really difficult. If you, if you want to create a collaboratively controlled uh, business entity, there's only the co-op, basically. And, but last year, I went through this whole process of founding a co-op, and it's, it's ridiculously difficult, and it's also top-down. So it's, I mean, it's... it's that's, that's Germany. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but still, I, I guess also in other yeah. countries, it is it is so it's a it's a very formal thing. Mm. I I have no idea. I don't know how it works. I, uh, how it works in Belgium or other countries. But the thing is, it's still it's a formal thing. If if you talk about about networks, you know, if you look at Sensorica, for instance, which is a, I think quite an interesting model of a uh, of a of a business entity that is. Um, that is no company in the traditional sense, and they they are they are totally restraining from from founding any uh, thing that that would that would get close to a traditional company. Of course, they are facing a lot of problems, like when it comes to the bank account and insurance and all that stuff. But they try they are currently trying to circumvent that. I think um, uh, it, th this is now about the time where we actually need new models of forming entities that are able to do stuff and that are also able to adopt technologies in a more flexible way. Because if you have ever went through this process of founding uh, a business entity of whatever form in whatever country, you're still you're part of this top-down thinking and those traditional structures. And it's really difficult to escape from that. Maybe I should rephrase my question a bit because it is not about founding such a structure. Yeah. Mm, I mean, about founding a the form, even form, if you got a form around, is relatively easy. My question is, for example, take you made, you built a yeah. cooperatively software de uh, development house, mm -hmm. and you get funding. That would be an interesting model to fund open source software development in a cooperative way. How do you deal with a decade down the line with that group of members of your cooperative, or also part of your governance structure, that no longer have the skills that meet the then technological <coughs> standards? Yeah. That is, um, I mean, mm. the problem is consensus is low. Yeah. We see it in a democracy, right? Consensus is low. Um, um, in order, and we see, like, really, Bitcoin is a fantastic use case, and it's a use case with a track record of eight years. And what we're doing in our research is we're actually studying all these um, consensus and governance problems because uh, based on Bitcoin and a little bit of, uh, based on um, uh, the Ethereum track record. And um, there are, I can give you the blockchain answer or also the off-chain answer um, is that consensus is low in general. We see it with democracy. And um, so we come from a world, uh, the analog world, we needed these command and control top-down structures because um, um, large groups of people are more efficiently organized in a command and control way. Um, now command and control has the agency problem where people that are representing the interests of other people and their information asymmetries, they don't always act in the best interest, whether it's politicians, acting in the, their, uh, or, you know, uh, representing uh, voters, or whether it's managers representing shareholders or employees. So blockchain is a possibility to get rid of this agency problem by disintermediation to a certain extent, but it also introduces new agency problems, you know, around the question of who understands the code, and this taps into what you said. And, for example, a blockchain has a few consensus problems that you addressed, and we're seeing it with the forks, um, is that it's slow, consensus is slow. In order to have a majority, an absolute majority, to vote for something um, and to agree on something, um, it takes a long time or they never agree. Uh, Bitcoin is facing this problem now with the block size debate, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and the community for a long time has not been coming to a consensus. And um, so we see that a technology that is only eight years old already faces the challenge of how to operate a system to stay agile, as you said it. Um, I would like to address two more issues and introduce uh, 
uh, an answer. We also have another problem with blockchain, even though I I'm really love blockchain. It's still based on plutocracy. In blockchain, in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, the more tokens you have, the more votes you have. Now, this is not a world I want to build. So we have to really look at what we're building. I, I'm try quite positive because if we look at the early days of democracy, it was also a plutocracy. Not everybody could vote, and it was one man, one vote. And uh, it wasn't even one man, one vote. If you had more money, your vote was more worth more. Then it was one man, one vote, and then women could vote, and other minorities. Uh, so I'm hoping that blockchain will also go into this direction. Minority rights, what you addressed, is a huge issue because when the minor majority uh, decides where to go, the minority, um, so how do you protect minority rights uh, in predefined code? This is very hard. Um, in the digital world, you can, you can split. A secession is easier than in the analog world. You fork, you stay on the other side of the fork. Um, um, we don't have answers to those questions, actually. And I, I can only agree with Ila, with you, what you said that I see this huge discrepancy about people building, for example, now the new blockchains. And they're mathematicians and physicians. They're not even simple programmers. They have two, one or two PhDs. Uh, on the protocol layer, it, it's really game theoretically very, very complex. And if you look at Ethereum, if you look at Bitcoin, um, very few people understand the codes that are being built on the protocol layer. It's super complex, yet so many people are affected by it. And so how can we make this more inclusive? And also, in a lot of discussions, um, <coughs> governance, like the social scientists, are not included into the discussion. Yet the social scientists have a lot of contribution of thinkings that have have been built for decades, if not centuries. Mm -hmm. So we need to really bring those two communities together. And Ella and I were planning an event in June, maybe, of uh, bringing the blockchain community, the hardcore blockchain community, the coders, together uh, with the social scientists and mm -hmm. the platform co-op community. So if anyone wants to be part of this event or has a contribution, approach us. Just very quickly, as a I think I'm still a social scientist, although I'm in a humanities faculty now, so I get to claim both. Um, I don't have an answer, and I think it's a really interesting point about how you get caught, especially if you use code as law in various ways, you get caught by that, and then how do you get out of it? Because you've not just embedded a technology that requires certain kind of technical things to make a change. You've embedded certain things in those technologies and the way it works, and people won't be happy with the way it changes, <coughs> so on. The only thing I can point to is that one of the things that's missing from the, the debate is that there is, a, there is a, of course, another main community that has spent a long time trying to work on these, which is the kind of activist social movement protest community. So if you look at the, the, the development from, if we, even if we start in the late 80s, but you should really go back earlier than that to the kind of the start of second wave feminism and so on. But even if you start at the late 80s and the start, the 90s and the rise of the first wave of the ultra globalization movement, and then the second wave of the ultra globalization movement, you see really huge efforts being put into cooperative forms of decision making. And that helps break things down a little bit because not only do you have some models to look at, which you can agree with or disagree with, but it's starting to break down cooperation into its elements. And that's partly what's needed, which is, you know, how do you make decisions in certain contexts? What is an individual in this context? Who has the rights to do what? So it starts to break the question down in ways in which, and you can see the ways people have experimented um, with ways of trying to make decisions on the fly. I've seen and been part of some very complicated decision-making mechanisms for demonstrations about where you're going to go and so on, and, and, but also in other kinds of techniques, the human microphone, all those, megaphone, I should say, all those kinds mm -hmm. of things. So I don't have an answer, I'm afraid, and I could see it's a big, pro you know, there's an issue there. On the other hand, I think there are some resources or there are some experiences elsewhere that are <coughs> worth looking at. Yeah. So my question is more on uh, the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, how, how to work on the decentralized web and cooperative uh, platforms. When I see blockchains or public ledger as a cryptocurrency, I somehow feel that the bank's intervention, for example, in Estonia, they started accepting uh, uh, bitcoins and now anyone can transact through the bank. And 
for people who don't understand what is blockchain, they think that it's a great thing. But somehow feel that the decentralization, even though it is happening, somehow it's uh, moving towards centralized. For example, uh, we can imagine that Uber at some point started uh, accepting the Bitcoins. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, my question is more on, is it a threat, a threat to the sovereign identity which you're talking about? Is this it, kind is of, what? is it the threat to the identity which, uh, sovereign identity which uh, you mentioned? Uh, what Bitcoin uh, or anything generates. And the second question is more on somehow like uh, I, I can't uh, understand how the, uh, there are different problems of blockchain. So one of the problems is that, uh, for example, IPFS, which is the permanent uh, web, somehow feel that uh, the right to be forgotten is not, cannot be addressed. And people again fall back to this model. And I, 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 I can't think myself like how these two uh, we don't have <laughs> answers yet. Your questions are all valid, and I think this is the reason I created the Blockchain <coughs> Hub. Uh, maybe a few words to the Blockchain Hub is, like what we do at the Hub, we, it's an information hub and a think tank. Uh, so we're not an accelerator. We might do that at some point, but our main goal is really to be a strategic think tank. M not, not strategic, but a um, socio-economics think tank, because it's such a massive game changer the decentral web, blockchain, IPFS, your sole sovereign identity. Um, we're at the very early stages and there are so many unanswered questions. So what we have uh, uh, at the hub, we have one work group, blockchain and law, the intersection, the future of law, are the coders of today, the lawyers of the future, are smart contracts, legal contracts, uh, what are the legal aspects of decentralized autonomous organizations in a, where you don't have a server and where you don't have a company and you don't have managers, so which law applies, all these things. We have one work group, blockchain and governance, because many of, many of the questions raised here about decentralized governance, uh, in the end, these are governance questions, the platform co-op questions. We don't have many of these answers. And the question you just said, the right to be forgotten, so identity and data privacy, we also starting a work group around that. Uh, we have one uh, lawyer who's <coughs> also a techie. Um, he is the founder of IPDB. And, um, and um, there are no answers. We're trying to tackle it. So if you're somehow involved, uh, interested in being part of finding the answers, uh, we can talk later. Yeah. It's really like 19, early 80s for the internet. I would say we don't know if you had who would have imagined Facebook a day before Facebook, right? Oh, I, um, a lot of yeah, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, Facebook is a bad, but because we have uh, MySpace and stuff like that, but Facebook did change the way we socially interact, or, or maybe before MySpace. Uh, you get the analogy. So. Who I think in the very early in the late 80s and the early 90s uh, in the early 90s when we first used email, yeah. who would have thought who, 10 years later what we could do based on top of that technology? Mm -hmm. So I think that was for most people hard to envision, and even those who knew that it would be a big game changer, they couldn't exactly predict what would happen or how we would tackle some problems. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's what makes me nervous, <laughs> having been through several of these uh, <laughs> revolutions already yeah. and ended up with Facebook, Google, yeah. Uber, um, <laughs> you know, um, the kind of problems, the, the disaggregation, the disintermediation of the middle, the, the, you know, what we've seen since the mid 70s, you know, is major growth in economic inequality worldwide, which we've yet to but we can start to put some of the pieces in place for understanding how the the internet or digital world has contributed to not necessarily counted so i don't in a way disagree with you because a lot of these changes are things that i personally benefit from and find fascinating and see huge potential in but it also ha always has a downside so i think we need to watch yeah. out for those downsides as they evolve because they are hard to predict yeah mm. I, I think if you talk about the right of being forgotten, what you mentioned, the, the question is, if you look at the internet as a, as a public space, then looking back at, you know, at, the, at the history of human societies, has there ever been anything such as a right to be forgotten, being erased from collective memory? And if so, uh, what, you know, what, what possibilities did I have 100, 200 years ago to not being included in a, I don't know, in an archive or what, whatever. 
and can we can we you know can we frame that as a as a human right now that we live in an information society and can we transfer that when we talk about yeah. about uh, um, internet law? And you've already become a dead guy that scorns, but there's no such thing as a right to be forgotten as the uh, reframing of the right for deletion. Um, that's not really a new thing. That is kind of overblown in especially the trade press, but the right to be forgotten is just the right to be deleted. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I'm a cryptographer, not a so yeah. social scientist, so my question yeah. was more on a technical point of view, that when you have a centralized mm -hmm. server, what we imagining a utopian world, we can delete. Like, the centralized copy of that can be deleted. But uh, I can't imagine myself, like, in a decentralized web, mm -hmm. if someone else hosts the copy of, like, for example, I, I was drunk and I put a photo on the decentralized web, and after that oh, I realized yeah. that I have to delete uh, it. But yeah. I somehow feel that there, at this point, uh, blockchains doesn't have that. If someone else hosts it, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't have control over my data. And well, that's I, my question. I think... I mean, we're not there yet, yes. but if we link self-sovereign identity with blockchain and it's just like hap <coughs> we're not there yet, then I can link the right to delete the picture I uh, posted uh, to you know um, to the the, the, the copies uh, on IPFS if it's IPFS or Swarm or whatever, and and then if I see a site that I want to delete it, it will be deleted. I think eventually down the line there will be a possibility of linking those things but we're not there yet. Yeah. Not there. yeah. And uh, to answer your question before because you say you're a cryptographer maybe it will be interesting to see many of these right to be deleted uh, maybe zero knowledge proofs is an answer are you aware yeah. of the yeah. yeah. So um so I think, uh, to an analogy to maybe the early ages of the internet, sometimes we're trying to find answers from an old world for a new world. For example, if you think back to Yahoo, whoever r r remembers Yahoo. So we had the uh, information data highway, as we called it, and the information was available, but how could we find it? So the er early ages, the days of search engines, the question was, how do I access this vast information on the internet? Yahoo and many others, they tried to catalog the content as if it were a physical library. And so they did this in the beginning until they reached a limit because the content was growing. And, uh, or you could self catalog, uh, catalog. And so why did Google, who came in very, very late in this, uh, sur uh, in this uh, search engine war, they came in very late. They found a new answer. They, they found the answer because they understood that the real value of a website is in the number of links pointing to it. And they took this as an indication of how to, um, um, to display the results in the search engine. So very often, early on in a technology, because we don't understand it yet, we're not comfortable yet, we're trying to find answers from the old world for the new world. And I think that might be our problem right now also for blockchain. We need more time. Tim, did you want to say something? I, I was going to quibble, <laughs> so I'm trying to quell. Uh, that idea of Google's came from citation indices, which existed before the web and the internet, so it was an old idea. Yes, but applied. it was more relevant than cataloging. Yeah, but it, it wasn't was about old and new. It was about getting the better idea in that context. So, that, Sorry, it was a quibble. I don't think it really contributes okay, to that. I'm okay, I'm going to pull us back to data protection, yeah. because I'm very curious about if especially people doing blockchain and cooperative platforms, their interest in privacy also extends to data protection. Uh, that's a short version of the question. Um, very, very kind of superficially, I, I would think as a data protection advocate, um, you would have serious problems with the idea of making data public because it would kill, for example, the concept of purpose specification, that you only collect data for the specific purpose that you're intending for. And, and this idea that you know we want to have the aggregated data and we want anyone to be able to access it and repurpose it and, and you know, contribute to the comments, for example, uh, would be very much in conflict with, I think, data protection. On the other hand, um, it seems, you know, the blockchain offers the, the, the kind of dream of the data protection advocate because it gives you a single terms of service and it's stable and it stays that way, right? It's coded into the technology. Um, Whereas, you know, in, if you look at the privacy policies or terms of services of companies right now, like Uber, they change all the time. We can't even track the changes. Um, so I'm wondering if these questions have come up 
and some of the initiatives that you're part of, like how do we deal with existing interpretation of privacy into law through data protection and what have been some questions and discussions? Okay, maybe that was a hard question. <laughs> All right. Well, I, you know, from what, what I can say from, the, from this platform co-op movement that I'm, I'm also part of, I think uh, this is now starting, I, I guess in the beginning, when, when this whole movement was, was being kicked off, and this is now one and a half years ago, merely, so it's not, it's not much time, it, people were more busy with the question on how to organize themselves, so creating mm -hmm. structures for democratic control, um, new forms of ownership, collective decision making, things like that. And also to adapt some of the technological shifts that were going on out there. But this whole question of how to ensure data was more pointed towards the, the big companies where we helped raising value in mm -hmm. you know, laboring for free, like writing, writing stuff on Facebook, Amazon, and, and so forth. So I, I guess this, this moment where people realize that they are adding values to these companies just by being active on them, uh, that, was, that was probably the starting point. But then asking yourself, what if, if, I, if I create my own platform and if I, if I add value to it, mm -hmm. so what to do with that and how to secure, how to secure my data there? I don't think this is, this is really part of the, of, the, of the mainstream debate in the mm -hmm. platform co mm -hmm. movement right now, but uh, I'm absolutely <coughs> sure we'll, we'll get there soon. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. this is becoming an issue, right. of course. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Tim, did you want to say something about it? Um, I just, I think I agree with that completely because a successful kind of cooperative, whether it's a platform or aggregator based on Bitcoin, you know, um, blockchain stuff like that, will face the problem that if you run something like that, you do harvest information off it. And whose is it? And how do you access it? And who do you give it to? And it implies a problem about the data that people give because the information can only be aggregated if people are already inputting and then if you're potentially tracking. And those are choices that will be made. You, you don't have to do those things on those platforms. Mm -hmm. But that's there's a huge power in, in there potentially. Um, so I think we will have to think about privacy. And I think one of the things is we'll have to start not doing away with but questioning the only sense of privacy being personal ownership of information about me. We will have to start thinking about on cooperative platforms or on other platforms, what is privacy in relationship to a network of people? So the question about deletion also raises to me the right to deletion. If you contribute to a community in some sense that's built through your contributions, are you allowed to delete and take them away? Because that's not just about you. It's not just a sovereign individual. You're not just alone. You built that in relationship to other people who built themselves in relationship to you. It's almost like the power model that mm. informs data protection is a very different one than the idea of the cooperatives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, so I agree with what you say. Um, first of all, I really like the distinction of my personal data versus uh, the collective compiled data of how we interact with each other and the different values of those different data sets. Um, and we have different privacy issues on blockchain-based solutions. Mm -hmm. So we will solve some that we have now, but we will introduce new ones. So this is one of those things that are hard to predict and we need to be very uh, watchful for this. But I would like to introduce a positive idea uh, on the transparency of this collective <coughs> data of how we interact with each other. And we have completely new forms of organizing, uh, self-aligning our interests around these shelling focal points and economic shelling points of where we interact with each other on these platforms and who we follow and why we follow them. This is an automatic form of um, um, uh, interest alignment mm -hmm. and um, so uh, we are looking into so the whole concept of decentralized autonomous organizations is to get rid of like disintermediate put the behavioral rules in the code the governance mm -hmm. rules in the code um, predefine them and then everything will be auto executed this in a way is governance as we know it from the world today. Like we have a s rule set that we put into code. The code is not 
written in law mm -hmm. anymore in, um, in human readable language, but now it's like um, um, a string of if-then connections that will be auto-enforced. That is one way to use it, but I think, and down the line, we have completely new ways of coordinating our behavior more intelligently around these focal points of behavior. And this is a, an opportunity as much as it's also a threat. And I think nobody, uh, the only thing that I would like to, to, to um, that I don't agree with you uh, is that in the decentral web, nobody will aggregate this data privately anymore. It will be publicly available. And therefore, I don't see it so much as a threat because we're moving more and more into a serverless world. And if it's publicly available, then we can build on top of each other instead of you know, grab the data and exploit it for personal profit. Okay, we're out of time. Um, I hope the panel made clear that there's much discussion to be had between the different communities, both those interested in data protection and privacy and those looking into cooperative platforms, um, cooperative futures and the blockchain. I hope you will grab the speakers after the panel and thank you for coming. And the next session is now, so move quickly. Thank you.